class. It's Dr. Jones. I'm here to talk to you a little bit about uh, the um, landmark article by Martin Seligman and Stephen Meyer uh, from 1967 on failure to escape traumatic shock. So um, this is one of uh, a series of studies that Martin Seligman was associated with and, and uh, Meyer as well uh, that led to the development of the theory of learned helplessness, which is a particular you know, way of looking at uh, the concept of depression. In human beings, but of course, this is um, from '67. This is some uh, good old-fashioned Skinnerian behavioral research with animals. Um, so I want to walk through this study because it is an experimental design. Um, but unlike a lot of the things we've discussed in class, it's not a, a human subject's design. It's a, it's an, um, in this case, a canine design. So let's move on and go to the first slide. So this is the abstract from uh, the article. Um, now hopefully going into this lecture, if you haven't already, please stop and read the article. Uh, what I recommend you do is to read the article um, with your assignment in hand, and then um, if you haven't filled in the answers to the assignment, just by virtue of reading the article, it certainly will address a lot of things in this lecture uh, that will help you to do so. So I'm just going to read you the, I won't read it to you, but let's, let's just go, you know, assume that it's read. But essentially, um, the abstract, as we've discussed previously, is supposed to be a summary of the entire, um, the entire study. You know, you essentially want to, in, you know, a, a, fair, a small number of words, you want to explain what the study is, what it's about, what you did, what you found, and essentially what that means. Um, so this is the abstract for the study, and it just, uh, focuses on the utilization of the escape avoidance behavior in a shuttle box as their dependent variable um, and how they have trained canine, canines through uh, conditioning to um, either be able to or not be able to um, escape from that shock in a training phase. So uh, again, this is a support for the idea of learned helplessness and let's go on to the next slide. So in the introduction, um, the authors review some previous research, some of which is actually done by one of the authors, by Seligman. Um, and this is just a recent study for them at the time. Um, and they had found that prior exposure of dogs to this inescapable shock in what's called a Pavlovian harness, which is, you know, sort of a lot, uh, keeps the animals in one position so they can't run away, essentially, um, and do what they naturally would do in, in reaction to an aversive stimulus. Um, but that it results in interference with subsequent escape or avoidance learning in a shuttle box. So th this is a, in a sense, this study is a replication and in some ways it's an expansion as well, but it certainly builds upon a previous study. Um, and typically these dogs that have been trained that they can't escape shock will not try to escape from it when they're given a, an opportunity to do so in the shuttle box. So they have normal reactivity, but after a few of these trials, they will passively accept the shock and fail to make escape movements. So um, if it does occur, it, it does not reliably predict future escapes or avoidance as it does in normal dogs. It doesn't show a normal pattern of learning, essentially. And uh, what they suggested was the degree of control over shock allowed the animal in the harness, uh, allowed to the animal in the harness may be the um, determinant of this interference effect. Whether or not the animal feels in control may determine whether or not they develop this learned helplessness. So according to that hypothesis, if shock is terminated independently of the subject's response during its initial experience with shock, uh, meaning if, if it has nothing to do with what the animal or the individual does, if it just happens independently, um, then this may interfere with their subsequent response uh, or you know, to escape or avoid shock in the future. Uh, if, however, they're able to terminate the shock themselves during the initial experience, then they should have normal escape or avoidance behavior uh, subsequently. So, it's, it's not so much that you learn that you can avoid it, it's that if you don't learn that you can avoid it, you tend to be more prone to accept and not decide, try to escape or avoid the shock. So they aim to investigate whether um, aversive stimulus or lack of control over the stimulus is basically leading to or is equal to helpless and passive behaviors. So their hypothesis is that the degree of the control over shock in the first exposure trials is a major determinant of whether or not there will be an interference effect in later trials. What they mean by interference is whether it will interfere with the animal's normal escape or avoidance behavior when confronting with some, confronted with something aversive. So um, as was kind of the case with the Elizabeth Loftus article we read, um, you'll find that this journal article actually covers more than one ex uh, physical experiment. There are two experiments that are encapsulated in the article, and because they come at, come at this from, they build on one another, and they sort of come at the question from two different directions, which is a good example of scientific rigor, right? 
we have some specific questions about how we want to examine this hypothesis and we know that we may not be able to build it all into one perfect mousetrap so to speak in one study that we need two studies and uh, what you don't always know uh, from reading the article but what sometimes is happening in the real world is that the results of the first study uh, either are promising but they fail to address certain issues or there's certain confounds that they come to realize later and then didn't control for or they sort of have a, a a eureka moment or an understanding even that just comes from that first study that says oh we need to look at this in another way to to further address it and further explore it and really be rigorous and if we want to make certain claims so this there's two experiments in this particular journal article and i'm going to go through them each in a little bit of detail um the first one um is experiment one is it investigates the effects of escapable as compared with inescapable shock on subsequent escape avoidance responding. Now that is very technical jargony uh, language, but if you look at that for a moment and break it down, um, the escapable versus inescapable is the uh, important part, right? That, that in a sense is the independent variable. That is the thing that's being manipulated. In the this training phase, in this initial phase, uh, is the animal uh, either learning that it can escape or that it cannot escape uh, shock? And will that then subsequently affect their responding to an escape or avoidance situation subsequently, later? And uh, ultimately, that's your dependent variable, is how do they behave when confronted with an avoidable um, escape or avoidance situation? So uh, the subjects were 30 dogs, um, six of which were discarded. That's horrible language for uh, those uh, dog lovers out there, uh, meaning they were discarded from the study. Um, and really what you get here in the method section, in the subject subsection, is a, a, dis a discussion essentially of about um, eligibility, inclusion, exclusion criteria for these dogs. So they started with 30 what they call experimentally naive mongrel dogs, right? So these are um, dogs that have not been through other sort of research studies. They haven't been, you know, polluted by uh, experiences and other behavioral studies. You know, they're coming to this in naive, so to speak. Um, mongrel dogs, mixed breed dogs, um, and they're all pretty much about the same size. And the reason why is because of the apparatus we're going to describe in a moment. So they have to be a certain size for everything to fit in, in terms of this to work effectively. Um, so why discard it, right? Let's talk about that for a moment. Um, they talk about their diet, water, things like that. Three dogs were discarded from the escape group, two because they failed to learn to escape shock in the harness, meaning they did not um, they weren't able to go through the initial phase uh, and learn that behavior, so they're discarded. Um, and one, because of procedural error. We're just going to leave that vague. That means something, uh, somebody who was conducting the study made a mistake, and therefore they kind of polluted that particular subject's ex experience, and so they discarded it. Three dogs discarded from the other condition, the, what they call the yoked control condition, which we'll talk about in a minute, because they were too small at the neck to be adequately restrained in the harness, so that's two who just happened because of the shape of their bodies, even though they were within the weight range, they were thin around the neck. They were certain, you know, mix of species, a uh, mix of, um, of birds, I should say. And so um, they didn't fit in the apparatus. So they discarded those two, and then one died. They don't explain. One dog died during treatment. We don't know anything beyond the details of that. So then we end up with um, essentially with three groups of eight. Um, is how it's broken down. So as I said, they're all roughly the same size, 15 to 19 inches in height, 20 to 20, 25 to 29 pounds in weight. So these are sort of like, uh, you know, small, medium-sized dogs. Um, so there's our, those are our subjects. Uh, they don't really talk much about how the dogs are obtained or where the subjects come from, but, you know, um, we, we hope uh, in an ethical process, maybe uh, adopted from the pound, who knows. Um, Next, we have the apparatus, and that's essentially, uh, you know, what are the materials we're utilizing in this study? And there's really two separate units to be aware of, uh, and these repeat um, very similarly in experiment two. Um, that is what's called the escapable slash inescapable shock unit. I'm going to show you pictures of both of these. This is a cloth hammock with the dog uh, that has four holes for the dog's legs. So essentially, the dog can be suspended off the ground, right? Can't run away. Um, but is comfortably supported throughout their, their torso in this sort of hammock. Just face it, it stops up here in the chest area. So the, the faces, the actual head and the face are involved in the apparatus. And there's a pressable panel to terminate the shock, right? There's panels on either side of the dog's head. It moves its head left to right. It pushes a panel with its face. And, uh, you know, it's very small pressure amount required. And that terminates the shock. Now, of course, that it's, it's deactivated for the 
uh, inescapable shock condition. Uh, they're utilizing a 500 volt transformer with 20,000 ohms current. Now, I'm not an electrician and I can't tell you personally um, what that level of shock entails. Um, and there's really not much discussion in the, um, the article about why they chose this exact um, amount of shock. Uh, it is um, essentially applied through a brass plate electrode coated with commercial electrode paste taped to the foot pads of their hind feet. Um, the shock intensity was 6.0 milliamps. Um, so there isn't really any discussion beyond that about why that level was chosen, right? And as, an, as I said, not being an electrician, I don't know. I mean, obviously it's not enough of a shock to cause death or and it's not meant to cause uh, intense or severe pain. It's meant to be aversive, right? So there is an operationalization of what's aversive, how much is enough that it bothers you, but not enough that it causes any permanent harm. Um, so that's the first unit, and we're going to see a picture of that in a moment. And then secondly, there is what's called the escape avoidance training unit, which is also referred to as a shuttle box, a two-way shuttle box. Um, it's essentially a box that has two separate uh, areas that are split by a barrier in the middle, uh, and the dog is able to jump over the barrier, which um, actually triggers a photoelectrode and therefore does not receive the shock. And the shock, again, is coming through the foot pads. It's, it's through the grate that they're standing on. Okay, so let's take a look at both of these. And I have two versions of this, and I'll explain why. So this is actually just cut from um, some research uh, articles about the learned helplessness experience. And you can see here at the top, this is the um, escapable, inescapable apparatus. Um, so the dog is sort of suspended uh, in the, the hammock. Um, you, what you don't see here is the panels. Um, the panels are on either side of the dog's face here so they can press them uh, to escape shock in that condition. What you're seeing below is the shuttle box, um, which uh, you, you can see has the um, rods that are electrified and the, the rods on the other side are safe from shock. Uh, it's a grid floor, so the shock can be administered. Um, there's a light uh, in the middle and that can sometimes be uh, used as a, as a conditioned stimulus for, um, for the, the shock about to be um, about to be delivered, therefore, the, you know, the animal has to make that connection, right, between uh, the two. So the, the unconditioned stimulus, I'm sorry, is the light, and the conditioned um, stimulus is the shock. Um, so the idea is you're giving the dog a, a pairing, which, you know, dogs are very good at learning these sort of basic Pavlovian classical, there's a reason why they call them Pavlov's dogs, right, from that initial research by Evan Pavlov. Um, but the idea is that you're trying to train the dog to avoid the shock, you know, so by conditioning, uh, by um, connecting those two stimuli, the light and the shock, it gives the dog an opportunity to escape, to not receive that shock, right? Uh, to show that it's learned this, um, this lesson through this conditioning process, okay? Now this one I chose because it's, uh, it's incredibly cute. It appears to be a little beagle. And I think for those animal lovers out there who are gonna find this uh, research a, a, a bit painful to think about, you really get a sense of, um, of, of, a, of a cute little you know, beagle in here doing this process and potentially receiving shock on its feet. You'll also notice there's a speaker on either end of the box. And I think what these were utilized for from my reading of the article is to essentially provide white noise so that there was no um, indication from the apparatus, from the, from the electrical workings or from the, the, um, the researchers outside of the box so that it didn't distract the dog. It was essentially trying to create a neutral in, um, laboratory environment. So, um, as I said, there, uh, is, there are three groups uh, in this first experiment. There is the escape group, and this is where they undergo the escapable training in the harness. Uh, and then they undergo um, 10 trials of escape avoidance training, which is the shuttle box aspect of the study. There is the yoked control group. I'm going to jump to number three here. Uh, they go through the exact same experience, except during the training in the harness, it is quote unquote inescapable. So triggering of the um, panels, the little paddles on either side, does nothing to stop the shock from occurring. It just happens at a, a randomized interval. That's consistent with what the um, escape group dogs would potentially receive. And then there is a normal control group that does not receive any training in the harness at all and just does the 10 trials of escape avoidance training. So uh, I'm not going to go into great detail of the results. I may reference the, uh, the article. I have a physical copy of the article here I'm looking at as well. Um, but if you look at uh, table one, 
Uh, if you want to talk about the actual um, mathematical results, this is comparing the three groups in terms of three outcomes. Uh, and if you reference your article, you should be able to see this. Um, there is the mean latency, which means how long it takes for the animal to uh, to respond um, to avoid the, the shock when it take when it reacts, engages in that leap over the barrier. Um, the percentage of subjects failing to escape shock on nine or more of the ten trials. So those that um, essentially uh, took or received um, what percentage just kind of stayed there and received the vast majority of the shocks and the mean number of failures to escape shocks in the 10 trials. So what's the average number of times that the, um, the animal did not, the, the dog did not jump over the barrier to avoid the shock. And what you find by looking at this, and I hope you're, you're following along, is that the escape and the normal control group look very similar to one another. Their mean latency is within um, just over one second difference, very, very close, as compared to 48.22 seconds for the yoked control, so significant difference there. Um, in terms of the percentage of subjects who failed to escape shock on nine or more of the 10 trials, zero of the escape did. They all were able to, uh, they all avoided the vast, you know, didn't, didn't sit there and, and receive the majority of the shocks. 12.5 in the normal control, 12.5%, 75% of the yoked control. Very distinct difference, again, for that third group. Uh, and then finally, mean number of failures to escape shock. The escape and normal control are 2.63 and 2.25. Um, mean number of failures uh, respectively, whereas the yoke control 7.25. So again, pretty uh, significant findings. In terms of just a manipulation check and the, the stage of the learning, what they found is there was really good evidence based on behavior that the escape group did learn to press the panel, that they were, uh, that the manipulation of the independent variable seemed to be effective. The dogs in the yoked condition, condition actually stopped panel pressing even in that initial phase. They, and then they displayed what's called interference during the subsequent shuttle box escape avoidance training. That interference meaning is interference with the normal uh, reaction to an aversive stimulus, the normal escape or avoid learning that we see in living things. Um, what they also did, interestingly enough, is they took six dogs from the yoked condition, remember the ones that were inescapable in their initial training, and they were retested seven days later, and five of them, five of the six, continued to fail to escape the shock. So they had learned this behavior. There was a reasonable interval of time, a week, uh, seven days later, and they continued to display significantly poor escape or avoidance of shock. So um, the discussion, as you remember, is where we sort of branch from the actual hard numbers a little bit and talk about what it means. Essentially, experiment one supports this hypothesis presented by Seligman and Meyer, that the degree of control con that possessed by a dog to terminate a shock will then be a determinant of how much interference they display subsequently when they have a chance to escape or avoid a shock. They basically found the interference only in the, um, the no escape group, the yoke control, I should say. Um, helplessness was generalized from one situation, the harness, to another shuttle, to the shuttle box, right? So that's an important finding as well, is that this experience that you went through where you learned helplessness, so to speak, uh, is not identical to a subsequent situation. You are now generalizing that experience to a new environment. And that's very telling, that's very important as far as the theory is concerned. And the explanation they offer is that the yoke control group learned that the shock termination was independent of their response. No matter what they did, it didn't matter, right? Um, they would not change the outcome. They would continue to experience something aversive. And so they call this, you know, this is tied to the idea of learned helplessness. Okay, let's talk about experiment two for a moment. I apologize as the sun's coming in a little bit, making the lighting even worse in here. Um, Experiment two investigates whether prior experience with escapable shock in the shuttle box mitigates the effects of inescapable shock in the harness or subsequent escape avoidance behavior. So again, a lot of um, you know technical jargon in there. Let's break that down for a minute. Whether or not you've gone through the experience of escaping shock, whether that uh, mitigates it if you subsequently are put in a situation where you have inescapable shock, okay? That's first. So, um, is there an inoculation that the, you know, that the uh, the, the dog can undergo um, that will somehow make it um, resilient towards a episode of potentially learning helplessness, and then will that subsequently lead them to behave differently? Um, so the theory or the thinking in this is that perhaps 
prior experience might inhibit the subject's learning in the harness, that it's not correlated to shock termination. In a sense, what that means, it's going to inhibit their learning of helplessness. And then also that it might allow the subject to discriminate between the escapability of shock in the shuttle box and the inescapability of shock in the harness. Um, so again, 30 dogs, uh, three discarded as well. Let me pull up the page there so we can talk about the circumstances. Um, experimentally, they were the same. They were experimentally naive. They were mongrels. Their weight and height and housing were very similar to experiment one. In fact, these might be uh, some of the same dogs. I'm not sure. I think they're different dogs to make sure there's no carryover effect. Um, two were discarded because of procedural errors. Again, a mistake in the process of administering the, the study. And one was uh, discarded because of illness. So this left us with 27 dogs randomly assigned to three groups of nine subjects each. Um, the apparatus is exactly the same. It's just the order and the way that it's delivered that is different. Okay, now we have again, three groups, um, but in this case we have what's called the pre-escape group, the no pre or no pre-escape group and the no inescapable group. Okay, so uh, the nomenclature I completely appreciate is a little confusing. So let's talk about what each of these groups went through. Uh, day one for the, pre, okay, that's the pre-escape group first. This is day one. They go through 10 escape avoidance trials, right? Uh, essentially, they go in the shuttle, the shuttle box and they are uh, given the opportunity to learn. If I jump over the barrier, no shock, okay? Uh, they are then put into the harness, the, the, the hammock, and they do inescapable training. So they receive shock where pushing the pedal, the paddles does not change the outcome. And then day three, 30 more trials in the shuttle box. So we bring them back to that original environment where they had learned to escape. And then uh, we'll, what will be the impact? In the no pre-group, there is only inescapable training in the harness and then 40 escape avoidance trials. Now the 40 is to make it equivalent to the two other groups, but if you notice what's, what's going on, this is essentially the control group. It doesn't have that initial period of um, training uh, in the shuttle box. And so uh, in a way, the, the no pre-group is actually identical to the yoke control. Maybe not identical perfectly, but essentially is the same uh, as far as the order of operations here. And then the no inescapable uh, group where the animal goes through again, 10 escape avoidance trials. It's simply strapped into the harness for 90 minutes and then receives no shock on day two. This is kind of a placebo um, control group that's added in there as well as the idea of, well, maybe there's something about just being in the strap, being in the harness, going through that experience. So we'll do one version where they don't get any shock. And then again, on day three, back to the shuttle box for the escape avoidance trials. So what were the results? The, the no pre-group um, showed significant interference with escape avoidance uh, responding in the shuttle box. That is those that just kind of were similar to the yoke control in the first experiment. It took them longer to escape on average and they failed to escape more often. However, the pre-escape and no inescapable groups did not show such interference. Now the no inescapable group is not of specific interest at this moment. The pre-escape is, this is the one that is identical to the no pre-group, right? The yoked control, so to speak, group, except they had that initial experience of going through uh, training, of having that initial learning that they could escape. So in a sense, you could argue that, you know, is this an inoculation against the, um, the experience of then going through an inescapable shock? And I won't get into the details of this, but they essentially utilize an ANOVA. Um, that's one of the statistical tests we've discussed when you're um, looking at an experimental design and you have more than, um, more than two levels of your independent variable you want to compare. We have three in this case. It's still a single factor experiment. Right, but it is now um, three groups, and so we have to utilize an ANOVA test, which looks at the differences between more than two groups. And they find that there is a significant effect for groups, and there is a uh, significant effect for um, the trial blocks, the, whether or not you have that um, first experience or not, that first training. They then run a, a test called du uh, Duncan's Multiple Range Test, and this basically says that of the three groups, the no pre-group is the one that differs from the others across all 40 trials with um, statistical significance of P less than 0.05, meaning that the type of results that they observed in the study have only a 5% chance of being due entirely just due to random to, to chance, so to speak.
three main findings from this um, second experiment. So the pre-escape subjects, with those that received that es essential uh, early training in the shuttle box, um, they did not react passively to subsequent shock in the shuttle box, um, which is kind of what a reiteration of what I already said. The pre-escape group, having received experience with inescapable shock in the shuttle box, showed enhanced panel pressing when exposed to inescapable shock in the harness. So they tried to exercise what they had learned uh, relative to, na to naive subjects who hadn't gone through the shuttle box experience. So the enhanced panel pressing was specifically the result of escapability of shock previously in the shuttle box. The pre-inescapable group did not show enhanced panel pressing even though it had not gone through that uh, initial phase. Um, the interference effect persisted for all 40 trials. So the, the pre-escape group, um, I'm sorry, the, the, the one that's equivalent to the, uh, the yoked control persisted throughout the 40 trials. So this experiment suggests that once the dogs learn that their actions could reduce shock, later failures to terminate that shock were inadequate interference with their motivation to escape. They continued to try. They continued to try and escape or avoid uh, aversive stimuli. So then the, the article goes into a general discussion. So uh, what they basically argue is that um, in the past, learning theory has stressed two operations. Um, what they call explicit um, contiguity between events, acquisition, and explicit non-contiguity extinction. Okay, this is operational conditioning speak. Um, so they're saying that essentially uh, in, in outside of the sort of classical operant and classical conditioning, they're saying that there is a third operation, that there's independence between events can still produce learning, that you can be in a new environment and carry that learning forward. And this may affect your behavior uh, in different sort of um, in different sorts of environments, not just in ones that are similar to that first place you learned. And then they talk about a subject who does not attempt to escape electric shock, a subject who, even if they do respond, may not benefit from instrumental contingencies. Um, what they mean by that is that if you have someone who seems to be in a state of having uh, essentially learned helplessness, if they are undergoing this type of uh, display of behavior, that traditional reinforcement, instrumental contingencies may not help them to change their behavior that we may need to um, recognize the strength of that state that they're in. So he extended learned helplessness in his research over the years as an explanation for clinical depression. And then he became the father of positive psychology and, and had an entire second career, second act in psychology. He's far more famous, I think, Martin Seligman is as the father of positive psychology than he is of um, this sort of behavioral. He is known very well, though, for the theory of learned helplessness in depression. Um, so this, there, it essentially has this idea that depressed individuals have learned to be helpless. That's where it comes from. So as a result of, of these aversive events, they believe that no matter what they do, they'll, um, they'll be unsuccessful and they have no control over their environment. It's very, very tied to uh, a concept in psychology called locus of control, which is an individual's belief as to whether or not they have control over their circumstances. It's uh, also tied to a concept called self-efficacy, your belief in your ability to change your situation. I sometimes talk to my patients in the clinical settings who are depressed about the vicious combination of helplessness and hopelessness. And these are two symptoms we associate with, with clinical depression. Um, and what I will typically say is I can summarize helplessness and hopelessness and how they work together and to, to reinforce depression in, in one sentence. My situation is not going to get better no matter what I do. Okay, that is a good example of sort of learned helplessness um, as it might be. Um, you know, played out with a, a geriatric patient like I see. So Seligman went on for uh, many years to carry out applied research in depression and applied his understanding of learned helplessness to treatment and clinical interventions. So let's talk a little bit about some limitations and some criticisms of the research. Um, so if you think about learned helplessness, it, it is essentially a behavioral theory. It's purely nurture in the nature versus nurture model, right? And what came after the 60s in behavioral research and psychology, or what, what was in reaction to behavioral research and psychology uh, in more like the 80s, 90s, was a lot of um, biobases, biological bases of behavior, a lot more focus on the brain, brain chemistry. That's also part of the antidepressant boom. This idea of, well, we manipulate serotonin, it changes depression, therefore depression should maybe be better defined as a condition that involves inadequate serotonin. That's a lot of reverse engineering. Uh, but anyway, uh, arguments about genetics and biology and neural chemistry and, and all these things became uh, very um, influential. And so 
uh, which that's essentially mostly a, in many cases a nature argument, not always, but it, it, it you know some of that comes from your DNA, some of that's not based on your experiences. So um, the criticism of learned helplessness as a theory of depression is that it's purely nurture. It says only the environment matters what the individual learns. And that uh, this doesn't leave any room for innate genetic factors in depression, of which we know there's certainly some uh, variability that's accounted for by that. So why do uncontrollable aversive experiences only lead to depression in some people but not others? So if learned helplessness is such an adequate theory, then why do we have people that go through experiences where you could argue they've learned helplessness but they don't become depressed? Um, the solution, which is, you know, this is kind of the solution you see in a lot of these discussions of nature versus nurture in psychology, is what's referred to as the diathesis stress model. Um, essentially, the diathesis stress model says that um, <clears throat> most psychological conditions are a result of both nature and nurture. The diathesis is your biological predisposition, predilection for a condition. So that could be um, genetics of DNA from, you know, from your, the DNA that you inherit from family members who also have a long history of depression, familial depression, or bipolar disorder, or schizophrenia, or Alzheimer's disease, whatever it is. Um, that there's a weakness, there's a, a diathesis, a, a vulnerability to that, and that under sufficient stress in the environment, emotional, physical, psychological, whatever, that diathesis will then become activated and express itself. So this is the diathesis stress model. It's very common in biology and psychology. And there's a lot of twin studies that you know can can look at this by having controlled you know for the genetic factors and then look at their um, different processes of attribution, self-efficacy, that sort of thing. So it can account for nature and still have a theory about learned helplessness. Uh, and then you know one big one that I think was not so prominent in 1967, but it certainly is when people think about this uh, article now. We've changed our opinions about what constitutes animal cruelty and animal testing. Um, we certainly do plenty of research still on animals for various things, um, you know, uh, especially in the medical field. Uh, there's still plenty of little white mice being utilized for research and as well as other animals. Um, so, of course, you know, the dogs experienced pain from repeated exposure to a 550 volt electric shock. As we mentioned before, you know, the, the stimulus has to be strong enough that it actually passes a manipulation check, that it actually is doing what you're claiming it's doing, that it is aversive or painful. Um, uh, I think, you know, this is one of those things where it, it might actually be helpful, to, uh, and I'm sure as the researchers you have this option, to have that level of shock administered to you. Now that might not be a full, sorry, my kids are laughing downstairs. That might not be a full experience of what it's like because we experience pain differently than dogs do and every person has their various subjective reactions to pain. But I do think that, you know, um, for me to understand how I feel ethically about this study, um, I think it might be beneficial to experience that level of shock and see how bad it is. Um, but of course, an important aspect is that dogs cannot consent to participate or withdraw. We know that one dog died during the treatment. We don't know why. Uh, it could have been natural causes. It could have been because of the treatment, but that's not really um, laid out in the article. And there's, as far as I know, there's no, hasn't been a lot of follow up as to why, the, uh, how that particular dog died. Um, but dogs can't consent, and they are, you know, being put into particularly aversive situations. Uh, many people are opposed to animal experimentation in general, and so um, yeah, on, just on principle alone for those individuals, this study has serious eth ethical problems. And then, of course, we have this question about ethics, right, which is, uh, do the ends justify the means in this case? Um, is there justified value scientifically in the findings? So the scientific knowledge gained about depression, about learned helplessness. Um, and then the ability to, out of that understanding to develop clinical interventions uh, like different various forms of therapy that's, that focus on self-efficacy and focus on people's locus of control feelings, you know, um, and therefore alleviate suffering and potentially even save lives of depressed individuals. How much is that information worth in terms of the suffering potentially of the subjects, the, in this case, the dogs in the research? So there's no exact black and white right or wrong answer to that question, but it's certainly something we have to think about in scientific research is, um, is, it, is it worth it? You know, whatever it is we're gonna find out from this and the value that it has, how do we carefully navigate our ethics and our morals and say that you know, we think the potential gains outweigh the potential harm in this case? Okay. Finally, here is a link to an online video. Uh, it's, now I think that this website is actually uh, I came across it just doing some Googling because I wanted to find some of those images that I wanted to share with you. 
uh, and I found it's essentially a, uh, like a demo for a presentation software, which is kind of like PowerPoint, uh, or it's, a, it's an alternative to PowerPoint. It's a little more topographic and moves around across a single um, poster, essentially. But it was put together by students who were studying this article. And so it's actually, it has some kind of twee ukulele music in it that might get on your nerves after a while. Um, but if you want a reiteration of some of the things we discussed, if you want to see it presented in a visually different way, I thought I'd provide the link. Um, so feel free to check that out as well. I hope you're all doing well, and I'll be talking to you soon about uh, review for the exam. Take care.